Well, hello my friends. Alfred Taro here, the Rebel Turner. Back just for a little bit today. Um, and I want to do a little quick turning. And today's turning, I say quick, but... Quick can sometimes take a little bit of time. Because I'm not looking at doing just a straightforward bowl, something that's already true. Uh, this is actually a rather odd piece of um, river birch that I got when I was up in North Carolina. Let me show you what I got and discuss which way I'm going to orient it and why. just a slab um, I know the point of interest that I would be looking at right off the bat would be this piece right here but where it is there isn't much that I can capture on this bark well it's all separated um, I'm pretty sure most of it is gonna go if I keep this as the top then some of this would be pretty solid in here and would maintain but I don't think that's the area that I'm going to focus on the piece is cut at a very odd angle so therefore it gives me different heights in different points over here at the highest point is about seven inches and at the lowest point is five inches so I want to utilize the widest point for the piece that I want to turn and the narrowest point will be kind of towards the base and what it's going to be it's going to be a side oriented ball shaped bowl that will or uh, hollow vessel that will capture this decay that's going through here hopefully let me see if I got it mounted just like this that's not going to catch it if I wanted that to be at the top I'm going to be turning all that away anyway but I think that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this towards the top and work this in and uh, it's this is really not going to work on the design it's only going to work on the finish of the mouth of the piece so I'm grabbing it fairly close to center on the back side center meaning from front to back uh, and not necessarily top to bottom at this point yet so I'm pretty close to the distance of the two halves and this one I'll kick it over just a little bit and therefore it gave me that it's a little top heavy so therefore I'll make one more adjustment to get off this Point where the weight is which is down here by tilting it up slightly slightly and that should do it I got a lot of pressure on this 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 cannot go anywhere uh, so I feel very confident that when I'm turning this that I am being safe I'm still a little close to one side over here I want to offset it still a little bit or else I'm gonna be way too close to this edge even if it's off balance I'd rather catch the bulk of the wood than the balancing right now so I'll cut it in this orientation to get in there and uh, get rid of some of this stuff that's going on in this piece right now that's pretty much center of the piece and the bowl well it's not gonna be huge the most it can be is about six inches on the belly which is the widest point that I got here I got seven so you figure by the time I get to it and down here it's actually might be closer to six if I'm perfectly balanced maybe maybe five and a half so that's good 
Everything looks pretty good in position. Let's see how it starts off. I'm going to start it off with my 5.8 uh, Hurricane Bow Gouge. I'm going to go in there. Not super aggressive because of the condition that the piece is, and I got to go fairly slow, but enough to start eating away at these outside edges. Now, I'm not going to go from here because this is a lot of banging and a lot of unnecessary wood chipping when I get to the outside edge and most of this would start splitting off. So rather than do that, go from this edge and catch the bark edge and it will go fair, uh, much quicker than any other way that I can think of. Speed, try three, four hundred up here. RPM. There's going to be a lot of people in the park flying off there. turning and the wife just decided to come and start uh, cutting the grass. I think it's uh, playing one of those guilt trips on me. But seeing that I'm going back to Miami tomorrow, I don't think the guilt is going to work too much on me. So anyway, this bowl gouge has not been sharpened also in quite some time. You know, and I made a comment last week's video about the buying economical and again, people come towards me as like oh you gotta try the uh, this or you gotta try that or, you know that's not the point that I'm making I'm simply saying you know this is an economical tool and it does a great job I know there's other great tools out there I know there's Thompson that you can go out and buy and you know and be perfectly happy with it but I'm not in the market to buy anything I'm just working with what I got and I got this. I already made the investment on this one because I didn't want to buy the very best. I figured that there's some tool that's compatible to the best. And it's just not being labeled as the best, but being good enough. Good enough. A good quality tool that you can use without breaking your wallet. These Hurricanes work really well. If you are a Thompson fan and you have Thompsons, you have a great tool. I don't have any doubt whatsoever that you have a great tool, maybe compatible to the current sun. Uh, but that wasn't the point that I was making. The point is work with what you got and if you can go out and buy, depending on your price budget or what you want to spend, then you can choose for any, any bow gouge that's going to cost you $150. I think you can rest assured that you're paying for a quality tool. Well, this is not $150. This is $100 with three of them. Okay, this one, a half inch, and the three eighths, I think. So, you know, there's a big price difference. It depends what you want to buy. You know, I got my current Sun, and I find myself using this a little bit more than the current Sun. So, uh, you know, I mean, my point is never to. Uh, feel that I need something better than what I got. No. I will resort to this Harbor Freight scraper, Harbor Freight, uh, uh, well, this is the handle, but I do have the Harbor Freight uh, custom made, or should I say, 
roughing gouge converted into a bow gouge, I will use all these tools before I go out and feel that I'm, I need to have, and that's the key, need to have a best tool. No way, no way. I need to have a tool that will work for me and I can have fun and not say, oh my God, I wish I could afford this or I wish I could afford that. Nope, never even crosses my mind. If I wanted to buy it, I would be in a position to buy it, but I don't need to buy it. And the last point I'll make on that, I'm not one of those people that has to have what somebody else has to have. I'm one of those people that I gotta have what I have and that's it. And some of the things I have, I probably don't even need either. So anyway, back away from this uh, bickering, um, let me continue with this turning and see how fast we can get this done. Still a nice sharp edge. It's going to help. slightly away from the direct on the direction that I'm going. So I'm facing slightly in that treble direction and that makes the cuts a lot easier, cleaner than going this way. Turn it in the direction that you want to go. So it's time to get in there a little bit closer with the tool rest. And sometimes I know that I'm a little far further away, but then sometimes I got things that are in my way that I have to clear up before I can get my tool rest close enough. So if you got something in the way and it's not going to be part of the design, work it out. Okay, so I already see that's out of my way. Now I can bring my tool rest closer. But gonna go from in here again. By the way, even though this is fairly dry, birch, which I didn't have a lot of experience working with it in, uh, in the raw like this, uh, other than birch plywoods and, you know, uh, finished stuff, birch cabinetry and stuff of that sort. But birch, to cut on the lathe, is really a pleasant wood to cut. Um, you can see that even though this is pretty dry, it's still giving me some very nice curls and shavings through this. Very dry, but it's given me nice shavings. So I can't go quite as deep as I'm going because my lathe will definitely stall down. So I gotta go light on my cuts. I'll make this in several passes and not keep going with this. And the piece is well balanced. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. That's 600 RPM.
get the best control, put your tool along your hip, knock it up good, and that way you won't get nearly as much vibration with your cuts, even when you are slightly further away from your, your workpiece. So, always be making adjustments to make life easier for you. Even if you don't know it and you don't remember it, the key is make slight adjustments to your stance, to your the height of uh, what you're holding your hand along. But even if you're low, put it up against your hip and work it that way. You will see a difference of night and day between your cuts uh, on your control of your cut. millimeter jaws so go in there make a quick tenon and that's deep enough and the tenon for the uh, 100 millimeter jaws the outside when they fully close is this size so I just want to end up about an eighth of an inch or, uh, three sixteenths of an inch smaller than this so it's very easy to guide on what I do when I'm sizing up this. Not perfectly round yet, but I might as well put it inside my uh, 100 millimeter jaws. No more slippage in the uh, spur drive. Not that it's doing much, but it will allow me to uh, work a little bit freer, work a little bit better than uh, than in between centers. I don't make the in between centers turning because it's the ultimate way of doing it, but it's a good secure way to start off the roughing rather than going where they a face play to a, you know anything different. But that's up to you. You do what what you feel comfortable doing and not necessarily with somebody else. Or what you feel that somebody else has to do. here babe just pull it out first and then
so it's that part of it is a matter of looking at it and you know something by the time I get to this round over here with these two ends this might be too small for the size of this so it might force me anyway to go in and then adjust the neck size to proportion of the body you can't have a small body and a big neck you can have a little neck and a big body so this has to be in proportionally smaller than what the bowl is and this is the area that I was working at to see what was the biggest I could get and that's the biggest I can get is between these two flat points right here which should be about six inches so that's the first area I'm going to concentrate on because I might lose that completely I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose that completely because I'm not going to like this being smaller than the uh, the neck So you can already see I would end up way too thick on this so concentrate on this area get it to where you want and look at flow and not necessarily this feature over here of what the piece is doing and the flow will cut into that. I'm gonna take this down from here and start shaping it towards the neck. Now this has a couple of options that you can see uh, while I'm doing this. I could literally continue with this cut going in this direction all the time or I could continue and towards the end flare out. I think this piece is asking for it to be tapered all the way up and no outside flare since either way I, or I know I have to go through this. So that's the area that I'm going to go with this particular piece. Now the drawback on this piece is I know that I got some nasty checking going through here here and this one here and quite a few spider web coming out from the pit so <clears throat> with something like that you know I know that there's other options but it's an option that I like I like using the wood shavings CA glue and that gives me a nice filler with something that's not too distracting because I believe the piece already has enough going on that you don't need an enhancement of some other sort. <clears throat> It doesn't have to follow the same curvature. You can do a slight change, but nothing drastic that's going to call the eye to that transition. And something that you want to settle, you make a slow move. Subtle adjustment with your cut, with your angle. If you want it to be drastic, then that's the area, the focal point of that particular piece. I believe, I believe all these cuts actually look pretty clean considering. There's nothing really that 
bothers me the majority of them are fairly clean until I actually just started scraping a little bit over here but I feel confident that this the way it is right now is an acceptable acceptable piece and this will play out just the way you see it over here I don't think I need to narrow down the neck a little bit it could use a slight slight uh, change on that but not much if anything because I like the gradual that's going there I'm just going to refine this last cut and just go in a little bit more than that You might have already noticed that on previous turnings or not, but I don't, I, I'll do it once in a while, but I don't generally carry my scraper flat against my, uh, my tool rest. I'll hold it up slight angle. And what that does is that gives you a little bit of a cushion. In the event that, let's say, not that I'm getting catches, but in the event you were to get a, a slightly catch, the tool would twist up on you in that direction or you have that little bit of cushion that you're working with and it also adjusts the angle worn a 45 against the wood grain giving you a slightly cleaner cut so I do that the majority the 99% of the time my scraper is not running flat on my uh, my tool rest I'm carrying it on a slight Now, if you're scraping, you're doing scraping and the cut is a little lesser than what you would want it to be, like this. Okay, and your cut is a little raised. <coughs> Give yourself a little sharp edge because your final cut should be your last cut and your last cut should be the sharpest cut. So nice sharp edge going here the same way I did it before, still not flat. Gonna give it that little bevel and let's see the difference that it makes on these two sides. This one and this one right here. Same speed, same approach. Now this used to be a flat scraper from Harbor Freight and I shaped it to this that I used. And it's really the only scraper that I got in the shop. So I'm not focusing on a one inch scraper and a negative rake or 
no doubt that they do a nice job as well. Oh, they do a, a great job, as a matter of fact. But, uh, again, it's little things that you get used to and you feel that you need to have. Or it's, um, you know, just working with what you got. But that's better. And that's quite a bit better, but not 100%. With the scraper, I'm not going to be able to do it and get this clean because we got end grain on these two ends. This is a side grain piece. But to show you, if you go with a push cut and you'll see the difference. It doesn't matter how hard I try, how sharp of a tool I uh, bring in here to get rid of that. But a bowl gouge, traditional, more so than a carbide cut of any type because carbide, you're still using it as a, as a scraper. Going there. Slight bevel. And just follow the bevel. And let's see what we got. And you can see it's a lot a lot clean a lot clean still not a hundred percent that's why we have sent it but I think what I got here I feel confident that uh, is good for me to work with getting a little squeaking sound I'm gonna spray the this with a little WD-40 But before I go to the finishing stages, I want to put some uh, CA glue and sawdust on the, some of these uh, cuts because when I start cutting the inside, I don't want that to become weak and fly away. There's no guarantee that this will eliminate that completely, but it will. If you have a chance of keeping it together, this will increase your chances much more. And again, this is um, river birch. I had never heard of river birch. I heard of white birch. I've heard of birches. I mean, I've had, and I was familiar with birch. I know the birch wood, the, what the tree looks like. Uh, perfectly familiar with that. But I had never heard of the, the term uh, river birch and uh, the person that cut this tree down which was in North Carolina uh, I contacted him and uh, asked if I could uh, help myself to some of those beautiful woods that I had seen so, he welcomed me to it as much as I wanted Unfortunately, whenever I got wood from people uh, that they cut down a tree, I would offer them um, a, a piece uh, that they could refer back to the tree before it was cut. But on this case, I didn't even get to meet the owner because it was over the phone that we, we spoke. Uh, it was basically, I saw the ad, I gave him a call, he wasn't at the property, and gave me the okay to go into the property and uh, help myself to whatever pieces I saw fit to take with me. So sometimes people can be trusting like that, but uh, you know, I don't blame when people are a little bit more hesitant than that because there's a lot of there's a lot of people that do stupid things. Uh, stupidity. sand this all these because this would be shine spots if I was not to sand this all the way off all this stuff that I just put the CA all that would show up at the end as shine and darker spots but uh, when all said and done you are most likely not going to see much of that except the uh, line where it was filled in but not the blob that you see here
I'm gonna give this a quick sanding in return, in reverse. going pretty well um, the wood is turning really nice oh yeah and by the way it gives you nice curves <laughs> my wife is looking at me like oh my god that's it <laughs> he just lost <laughs> anyway I am set up she was actually cleaning up and I told her that I need some of these curls, so I, I, I felt compelled that I had to do that. But anyway, i um, got my uh, Halloween tool set up. And uh, with the teardrop cutter, I'm going to go in here and see how it goes. How this cutter is going to do in this piece. My uh, good friend Wagga Parra uh, sent me last year, and uh, the bar was really sent me this year as gifts, more gifts from the crowd.
Okay, I'm gonna go with my one inch drill bit in there and go, let's see, as deep as I have to. And depthness I need to go in about seven inches. Seven inches will bring me to the middle of the chuck. So that's my guide of how deep I have to go. Turning the inside of a hollow vessel is always the trickiest and that's the area that can be most dangerous on a lathe uh, because catch is almost inevitable uh, when you're going in too deep like that and you can't possibly put your tool rest all the way inside to, to help you out with that situation. So having a long arm tool goes a long ways helping you on dealing with that
of the heat being applied to the piece is checking it all out really checking it so this would be ideal for a little bit of epoxy on this seeing that I have cracks that are opened up more than what I wanted them to be the ones that started off at the beginning are pretty much the way they were um, the CA somewhat worked on that but these a little bit more uh, but again sawdust is still an alternative to do a repair as long as you like it not as long as somebody else likes it not as long as somebody says that it's okay it's what you like if you like it then it's perfect and I will send this with the late stopped again just to uh, get rid of this dark area although some of it with camouflage of course with the uh, finish once Yorkshire grit goes up on this it would uh, take some of this so that's an offensive one and I got a little bit smaller ones on where the the pit is on this side there's another pit on the other side but uh, I really haven't seen that much checking over there yet you know if you have a problem with getting rid of the CA CA gives you an awesome finish <coughs> on a piece that um, it's not my specialty, so I'm not going to tell you how to do it. But if you look up Captain Eddie, Eddie Castle, which is an amazing guy, I, I, I learned a lot from him. So he was, in my early days, a huge inspiration to tips and tricks. Um, more so than the actual turning itself. Um, uh, he is an awesome wood turner as well, but uh, his tip, uh, tips and tricks uh, next to none. I mean, nobody, nobody can touch him on uh, on that area on his channel. And I gotta say, like I said, a lot of my things that I have done uh, were derived some from him um, either stuff that he directly showed or stuff that I already knew uh, but whatever um, that I didn't think anybody invented the wheel by doing it and that's just it I uh, if it's something subtle I'm not going to make a big deal that look what I did or look what you know somebody did uh, so uh, but if it's something really unique and something that really catches my attention uh, by all means I'll be out there shouting it out at the, the great work that whoever it was did um, And sometimes we do something and we think we're the first ones to have done it. There's uh, a difference between that and uh, trying to maliciously try to take credit. For instance, my hat, STFU hat. I, I'm bad with abbreviations uh, and acronyms, so uh, one day I was at work and I was thinking. You know, it's like, damn, you know, like I, I offer too much information, uh, you know, to that client. Uh, I really need to learn to, uh, you know, only give the information that's being requested rather than offer too much. And 
I thought I had come up with that. And it's like, oh, I need a hat that says shut the fuck up out of it. Uh, or something like that. And I thought of it and it's like, oh, but I can't wear a hat that says STFU. Um, or nobody will know what it means. Uh, actually, that's how I thought about it. Really, nobody's going to know what it means, but I know what it means. Uh, you know, it means for me to shut up. And uh, so, uh, quickly before I forgot the abbreviations, I wrote it down on a piece of paper, and I went to a hat place, and I brought it and gave it to the girl, so she wouldn't forget exactly what I wanted. I wanted those specific letters. And she looked at it, and no comment, no glancing, no... Uh, oh, that's uh, good. No asking, what does it mean? Nothing. So anyway, I went back, picked up the hat when it was done. I put it on, walked by. I was working in a mall. Walked by a group of people. It's like, hey, nice hat. It's like, gee, thanks. They're thinking that they like the lettering, they like the style, they like the color. Whatever. Go to Starbucks. Like, hey, buddy, nice poker hat. And again, I looked, why would it be a good poker, ha uh, poker hat? So, it's like, thanks. Uh, I, I think I might have said, well, maybe I should take a poker plane. Anyway, I walked back out on a group of kids, again, walking by, you know, they looked at me, looked at the hat, I started giggling, it's like, whoa, I missed a nice hat. It's like, why is it a nice hat? And, uh, oh, uh, the STFU. It's like, why? What does it mean? And they started laughing. It's like, do you know what it stands for? And they go, yeah. And one of the kids comes up to me and whispers in, whispers in my ear, shut the fuck up. It's like, what the heck? Everybody knows what it means except me. <laughs> so, when I made up the hat, I actually had to thought of the idea that I need a backup for my insanity of making a hat with such profanity. I uh, decided, well, okay, what else could it mean? Save time for us. So if a nice person asked me and I didn't want to explain, I would say, yeah, it stands for save time for us. That was my alternate meeting to the hat. So the boat is named Safe Time For Us. So it's a family joke. <laughs> there was a huge, huge joke when I told my kids, adult kids, that the story and that I had, I thought I had to come up with it. And I mean, they literally, literally fell on the floor and rolled laughing so loud that they thought, <laughs> that I thought I had come up with that abbreviation. I guess it was widely used on the internet and texts and stuff of that sort. <laughs> Except I did not know. But anyway, the story of that is that if you don't know you did something or if you don't know anybody else did something, you take a little credit for it, I guess that's okay. And if somebody corrects you, uh, you know, you can always mend and say, oh, I'm sorry, I I had never seen it. Well, you can at least put, I have never seen this done. It might have been done, but here's what I'm going to do. And uh, I, I do that sometimes. And I know that, uh, well, I don't know that it was, but the odds are pretty good that somebody else has already done it as well. Back to sending this with the 80 grit. Well, for today, that's all I'm going to be doing. The inside, the thickness is pretty good. It needs a little bit more refining. I'll go back in here when I come back next weekend. But for now, I'm going to leave it as it is. As you saw, there was a lot of additional checking that came up from the heat that was being uh, produced by the cutter inside and the sawdust the shavings going in it produced a lot of heat and therefore it checked quite a bit more than what it was but you know me i like checking so the fix for the checking in my case was sawdust 
and CA and some sand. When I come back, I'm going to see how we do on removing the CA dark spots throughout here and camouflage this a little bit and apply finished sanding both inside and out. Thin it down slightly a little bit more on the inside and give it a finish. I might post this up to this point and just focus on the turning part of it. And next week I'll focus strictly on the finishing of this piece. Well, thanks for watching again. And I'll be back next week and hopefully can finish it up. Take care. Thank you.